Hello, hello, happy Monday. Once again, I am delighted to be having a conversation that I would happily have in the privacy of my own living room or at a coffee shop anywhere in the world with a woman that I respect and I, um, I enjoy her work and um, I just like her as a human. So I'm really delighted today to be able to chat with Melissa Coleman of The Faux Martha. And we're gonna be chat chatting about creativity today, um, about trusting ourselves, making space in our lives for creativity, whatever that looks like to you, and also making the everyday beautiful. So, um, I don't know if you were joining me on with Courtney last week, but if you were or you followed me for any length of time, you know that Facebook Lives can be glitchy. So um, I will just, oh, Melissa's here. So I'm gonna bring Melissa on. Hey, hey Melissa. Hey, Melissa. I'm well. I'm well. Okay, okay we've got a Melissa. Do Melissa, you have you earbuds? Earbuds? I do. Let me go. Okay. Okay. We'll just wait. We'll just wait. Sometimes, Sometimes if we get this, if we weird, get this weird, help if my guess. My guess. We'll just we'll just give her a sec. Okay. Good. Okay. You can hear me okay? I can. Can you hear me better? Yeah. Yeah. We got rid of the feedback. Great. Phew. Ooh. We made it. We made it? <laughs> I'm so bad with technology. Actually, that worked really smoothly today. Sometimes Good. it takes a while for me and my guests to get on together. But... Yes. <laughs> We're using a free platform, so it's hard to complain too hard, right? Because right, it is right. what it is. And it's always <laughs> changing, too. So I'll like look up yeah. tutorials that are from two years ago, and the interface is completely different. Yeah, it is always changing. That is true. Okay, I'm just turning up my volume a bit. Okay. All right, so um, for everybody watching, if you don't know Melissa, I have a little bio that I'm going to read. And uh, Melissa will be embarrassed over there as I read it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Melissa Coleman is a, I love this, a designer, dinner maker, and simplicity chaser. And the right brain and founder of The Faux Martha. She's also the author of a very pretty cookbook, The Minimalist mm -hmm. Kitchen, which I bought myself, but my daughter stole. And it lives with her <laughs> in her university dorm. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so cool. Isn't that? That's a pretty good testimony, I think. That's huge. That's incredible. Yeah, and it's the only, I'm pretty sure it's the only cookbook she has with her at school, so. Oh, my gosh. Okay, um, and I had the privilege of meet, meeting Melissa face-to-face -face last fall, and um, I like to say that I, well, I, did, I just decided that I liked you as a human, so mm. there we go. <laughs> I felt the same immediately about you. Yeah, and it's, <laughs> Well, thanks. And it's funny because um, sometimes meeting face to face really is a different experience, isn't it? Especially for those of us who are, if we're strong introverts and, yeah, you know, we get to know each other on a different level face to face. Yeah. And you get to see facial expressions that that just gets lost on the internet or tone. Like even my jokes, they're, I think they're funny in person. I don't think they're funny online and my husband might differ if they're actually funny in person too, but still it's different when you see a human. It is. Yeah. Um, can you see if you can turn up your volume a little bit? Mm -hmm. yeah, I can I... hear you, but it'll. Okay. Now, can you hear me a little better? Um, I don't think it changed too much, but I can mm. still hear you though. So I'm not worried about it, but yeah. Okay. I'll keep All right. maybe this well, close. Um, Melissa, you shared some news on your purse. I don't know if it was your personal page or a public page, but you have some 
exciting news in your life right now. And I don't know if that's public knowledge yet. It is. It is. It just became public knowledge last week, which is weird that personal personal stuff is now public and that there's even a need for it to be public. It's kind of all strange, but it's the world we live in and the one yeah. I put myself in. <laughs> yeah, we choose. I think so, we, we do consciously choose it to some right. degree, but not everything right. is is for the public but in this case you're having a baby i am i'm having a baby i'm about i think i'm 16 weeks congratulations thank you thank you yeah very exciting and so your babe is going to have a big sister who will be about six at the time yep she'll be six and a half when she's born yeah Yeah, fun so in our house we have age gaps too there's five and a half years between the top the first two and then or no four and a half and then five and a half. Oh, nice. So there's, yeah. I feel like the age gap, there's fewer of us out there. Yeah. yeah, I think so too. But I liked it. That's what worked well for us as a family and felt right. And yeah, so I don't know that I could ha- have handled any more before now. Yeah. But, so I waited and I waited. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I waited. And, and I mean, this is a totally different aside from the topic we're going to be chatting about. But yeah. also my mom died in between oh, man. my girls. And um, I felt like I needed to wait too, to kind of come up out of that grieving process yeah. before I felt ready to carry a baby healthfully again. Yeah. Um, so somebody's going to ring my bell. There's a package and hopefully they're <laughs> not needing me to sign. Oh, shoot. Okay, guys, I have to ignore it. Um, oh, this is hard because I can totally see right through the window. <laughs> I okay, know. It's so weird working topic. at home. <laughs> um, so, all right. So today we are talking about creativity, trusting ourselves, which feels really important, making space in our lives for creativity and making the everyday beautiful. I'm so- she can sort of see me. <laughs> oh, you guys. I don't know what to do. I'm sorry. Just the hold on a we, second. The world we live in now. Okay, you guys. Oh my goodness. I've never <laughs> left a Facebook live before to go to the door, but she's, I'm like waving at her and she's not getting it. And it's not even for me. It's yes. for my neighbor. Uh, oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, okay. I think I lost some people in the process. Okay. Um, well, okay. This is life. And we <laughs> yes. are just rolling with it. And live. It's live, live. There is no <laughs> edit totally or backspace. All right. Um, so Melissa, a few little questions just to help me get to know you better and people to get you the- to know you better. And I do want to tell you that you sent me some of your thoughts about my questions. Mm -hmm. I actually didn't read them. I haven't had time. So um, I just figured that you processed a little bit and we'll just, this is all going to be new for me. Okay. Great. Great. (laughs) So um, Melissa, do you think that you're more head, heart or gut led in life and work? I would, I think I say I think a lot. I think I lead with my gut, but it's connected so closely to my heart, but rarely does logic uh, intercede. <laughs> okay. All right. So I would so say it goes say from I here so. to here to here. Yep. Mm-hmm. I'm not certain about a lot in life. So what I know now about myself, I'll know more about myself tomorrow and especially a, a year from now, I hate to uh, be so permanent about anything, which yeah. for better or worse, it's good and bad. Yeah. I mean, and we're all, we really are all becoming, right? Mm-hmm. We're uncovering the truth of who we are and, um, and we're stretching and growing and hopefully we're also becoming more resourced and learning to access these different parts of our yes. intuition or our right? Thinking in different ways. And so it isn't maybe always so like um, all or nothing or black black and white. Right. Yep. I've definitely learned that over the last couple of years. It's 
far from linear, at least for me. Yeah. And I think this ties really well into our co- the talk about creativity too and trusting ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, but so you guys who are listening, you may have heard me talk about the Enneagram. I'm a big Enneagram geek. It's a personality model, my favorite one. I think it teaches us a lot about who we are, our motivations, um, our struggles, and also our strengths. Mm-hmm. And then we can use that information to help us show up fully to life. So um, what is your Enneatype? I am Melissa. a, I'm a nine. So the nine is the peacemaker and they can have a hard time making decisions, yes. right? Or maybe using their voice all the time Yes. in a concise way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, just really briefly, is there anything that jumps out at you? Cause we're going to talk about creativity. Um, does being a nine on the Enneagram, mm-hmm. Does it frustrate you or does it serve you in some concrete ways that immediately jump out at you in terms of living a creative life? Oh man, I haven't thought about it in terms of creativity. Gosh, that's a really good question. I've kind of had to come to grips with it as my blog and my business have grown and and it's kind of grown from a creative endeavor to there's, there's business parts to it. And I'm not really an advocate of myself and I just like to get lost in things. And so those parts have been a little bit harder for me, articulating who I am, knowing who I am. Mm -hmm. Um, and that has caused a lot of problems for me to be creative, I would say. Um, and maybe in being a nine, it was also hard for me to even fully believe that I was a creative and then communicate that to other people. Because you heard me say a second ago, I think I lead with my gut and then my heart and then maybe logic, probably not. Um, I'm just not sure about a lot. And I think that plays into the nine. But with an idea, I hold it really loosely at first. And then I will chase it. If I really, really believe in it, I will chase it, which is doesn't really speak to the indecisiveness of my personality. Um, okay. I don't know. That's a great question that okay. I hope to have more It'll clarity on. Fun food for thought. Yes. But I do think it makes sense that like in, I find it easy, at least in the online business space to see how there are certain types who are even a little bit more aggressive. And I don't mean Mm -hmm. that in a negative sense, but they're kind of more, they advocate for themselves. They're willing to push a little bit, be heard. And then there's some of us who tend to not be, that's not where we naturally operate. So we could end up hiding or missing opportunities even because we don't speak up for ourselves or things like that. Yes, that is 100% me. I'm the latter. Okay. And yet you've done an amazing job of leveraging your strengths and learning how to do this. And I know we'll get there later in the Mm -hmm. interview because it's one of the things that I was fascinated by when I met you last year and you share very honestly about, um, and we'll get, we'll get there of course, but like where you were at in your business and almost quitting and then Mm -hmm. trying to look for ways to problem solve, like to honor the truth of who you are and then bring in help who, you know, a woman who operates in different gifting to help facilitate your work. And I just think that's amazing, beautiful. And actually, I think it could be really inspiring for a lot of people. So I'm looking Mm. forward to getting to that. Cool. Because you know what? I think a lot of us feel like we're not good enough. Mm -hmm. We see our, our struggles, right? And we can end up quitting as opposed to just saying, hey, there's gifting inherent in this person that I am. And also I can learn how to work with the truth of who I am. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, well, which season most inspires you and why? I am an anomaly here, but I love, love, love winter. Um, okay. I, I lived in Colorado as a kid for two years and every other place I lived was a, a warm weather place and living in Colorado from second and third grade was so incredibly memorable that I wanted to get back to snow as soon okay. as I could. So once I became an adult and could make my own decisions, I moved to cold weather and mm-hmm. I love the rhythm of life with winter and I love the reminders of winter that other seasons just don't offer. 
and winter, even when I watch it snow, it gives me the permission I need to slow down and why I need permission. I'm not really sure. Uh, but somehow winter is just this gentle reminder that gives me permission. It's okay to slow down, to hunker down, mm -hmm. to get lost in an idea, to pick up your knitting needles again. And no other season does that so powerfully for me. Mm -hmm. I really love that. And I wouldn't say that I love winter at all because <laughs> I feel like I'm trapped inside for half mm -hmm. the year. Um, because I have a hip replacement, I'm, I'm worried. I have to be really careful about not breaking that hip again. So then yeah. I can't just be outside. That's the really hard part for me. But, um, but I do really deeply appreciate the wisdom that we find in nature and those mm -hmm. calls to listen in and to mind for the gifts in every season. And to remember, like you were touching on, is that rest is an important part of life and letting go mm -hmm. and being hidden or waiting and all of those messages that winter can bring up for us those yeah. are powerful for me i'm resistant to them often yes same i am that way about summer <laughs> okay but i i love i love fall and spring those transitional seasons yes. <laughs> all right um so Let's start then by sharing how you define creativity and how it's tied to the idea of making the everyday beautiful. Because, and I'm just going to preface just because um, there's like, you know, a lot more people are in the minimalist or simple living space. We're talking about, um, is it Hugo? Like yes. that idea. Yeah. 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 And, um, and so talking about beauty in some seasons or comfort, but we don't necessarily link that to the idea of creativity or the idea that maybe we're all creative, but I'll let you define creativity. Yeah. Creativity. I like to think of it as I should say too, I have been dabbling in creativity for a long, long time, but it's as with everything with age, it's becoming more clear to me and I'm sure it will continue to progress that way, but I view creativity as creating something new from something else already in existence. And creativity, a lot of times people think it's creating something brand, brand new. Um, and that feels intimidating. And I like the piece of it that I get to create with something from that's already in existence. Like when I paint, I grab paint and I grab a paintbrush and a canvas, or when I cook, I grab ingredients that are already in my pantry and, and what I do with that is creative, but I already have a head start. The blank canvas isn't quite as intimidating when I'm honoring the tools and the ideas and everything else that's already around me that's influencing me. Right, it reminds me of my daughter. My older daughter is a pianist. Mm -hmm. um, she's also a mathematician. She's a math major mm. and she's, she'll, she's remarkable at like art and piano anything hands-on but she thinks she's not creative because she um she reads music mm -hmm. she doesn't she doesn't like create it on her own or she she like uses even math in her art but she doesn't recreate the wheel almost and I'm like oh, but this is amazing like you are yeah. creative but isn't that amazing how we we don't recognize like we've really limited maybe the idea of what it means to be creative yes. to and, totally and i love the idea too of the 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 how humble it is to go into a kitchen and pull together local mm -hmm. in, especially if you can access local in season things and be like hmm, what am i going to make today and you don't even need a cookbook you right. just need to put together ingredients <laughs> right right and then when you think too about cooking in general, you think about the farmer that made or produced this thing and that, that this idea, it's not so individualistic. It's just a compilation of a lot of artisans or a lot of people or creators or makers. And I oftentimes will refer to what I do instead of saying I'm a creative, um, I will say, I just kind of dumb it down and say, I like to make things because at the root of it, for me, I like I like my hands to be busy, like your daughter. I like, 
um, to get my fingers into the flower when I'm making scones or I like to hold the needles, the knitting needles and feel the yarn. I just like, you, you can't see right now, but I'm holding earplugs and I'm squeezing them. My mm. hands need to move and yeah. it's because I like to make things. So I call myself a maker and that feels mm. a little less intimidating to me. Well, and we're going to get here too, but I, I think we're just going to jump all over the place. <laughs> and, and so I have, have always admired people who are hands-on tactile creators and I'm not that. Hmm. Even though I did, I have like grown herbs and made salves and I bake and I used to oil paint, play the flute and things, but I never felt like I certainly didn't see myself as creative. Yeah. Um, and it actually in these past, maybe only the past two years, even I've started to own the fact that I am, I'm always playing. Yeah. And whether it's salves in the kitchen or words, I'm always playing and I'm trying to make sense of the world in some way by playing mm -hmm. whatever that looks like so I love that you use the word play we have it's actually knitted not that that really matters it's hand knitted um, and then there's a wire through it and it says play in cursive and I've hung it up in my daughter's room because it was a word if I could give one word to her I wanted to give her the word play and I recognize for her it means something so different than it means for me as an adult and I'm beginning to wonder if that word means more to me um, or if it was for me rather than for her. But anytime I have been lost in what I'm doing professionally, which is usually a, a creative endeavor, I play. And if anybody asks me for advice on um, how do I know what's next? What do I do? I say play and it sounds so simple, but it's, it is so childish in that if we give kids some tools, they start playing and they, they create something new from something that already exists. And it's so simple, but so beautiful and powerful. And for me, play has given me so many answers that no one else could give me. I asked everyone else to give me these answers because I'm a nine and I'm unsure about myself a lot. Um, but playing gave me and continues to give me a lot of answers. And I'm actually in a transitional phase right now with where I might be headed and I'm playing and I'm taking my own advice and trying something on. Does it work? Does it not? Does it fit my skill set? If it doesn't, can I bring someone else on? Um, it's just a really safe place to explore mm -hmm. an idea or a problem. Yeah. And um, I actually, it's really meaningful for me too. And it's funny. So you're a nine, I'm a one on the Enneagram, mm -hmm. like a dominant one type perfectionist. I want life to go according to plan. I feel safer mm -hmm. when my life is all orderly and the ch boxes are checked. And yes. unfortunately, life keeps throwing me opportunity to loosen my grip. Mm. <laughs> um, and honestly, my business um, has been the only way that I've managed to not quit because I was building it as I was walking through some trauma, pain, mm. challenge, um, was to give myself permission to play and actually yeah. to open up to joyful possibility, which was very much against my pattern but it was part of my healing process hmm. is this idea of I don't have to be in control of a mm -hmm. precise outcome. Mm -hmm. I can show up and I can do something just because it compels me and I can just see what happens. And it has been marvelous. Yeah. It is. <laughs> so yes. Amen. Yeah. That. Yeah. And marvelous doesn't mean perfect, but marvelous right. means freeing and mm -hmm. beautiful and all sorts of good things. Yeah. So, um, I want to look, so we had chatted about your definition, a bit about creativity, and then why, why is this so important, do you think, that we even make space to create? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for me, personally, when I started my blog, I was working a full-time job in a creative industry. I was a graphic designer, and yet I still needed some additional personal space to create, so I started my blog 11 years ago and I've kind of held it the same way that I hold it now. It's always been a personal project. I guess in a lot of ways uh, to use the word we were just talking about to play, to explore ideas, 
to capture what's going on. I'm, I tend to, I don't know if I'm explaining this right, but I tend to be almost so present that I kind of miss what's going on. But if I can write about it, if I can take a picture of it, if I can see the repetition over a period of time, I can begin to understand uh, what's going on in, in my own personal life in ways that I wouldn't otherwise. So for me, it's, it's just been incredibly impor- an incredibly important space for me to process life. And somehow, I have no idea, but somehow this thing that I've created online that so many of us have created these spaces online ha- have been powerful for other people, even though for me it was, it was truly just a personal project that had mm-hmm. value for me that somehow it could give value to someone else. Does it still have value for you in the same way? Depends on the day. Um, Honestly, uh, vlogging is a hard thing for me. I love it for all the reasons that I started, but it's changed so much. And, you know, there's numbers attached to our names and there's expectations with, when you put a numerical number to a person and those parts are really hard for me. I'm also learning too that I'm quite an introvert and I look like an extrovert online because I'm putting myself out there. No, and you don't. I don't. You okay, do not. Good. Sometimes <laughs> I feel that way, but that's probably the nine in me thinking, oh, I must not look to like another them. Introvert. Yes. <laughs> But I've tried on being an extrovert. I've gone out, I've spoken in public. Even this makes me a little nervous of speaking without backspace, without the quietness of my computer and keyboard and and, and lots of space to think and delete and process. Um, So I like it for all the reasons I started and I don't like it for all the reasons of what kind of what it is today. But the hard part is, is it, it employs me. It allowed me to leave my old full-time job and Mm -hmm. it employs me to keep this full-time job, which is incredibly valuable, but it's, it's both. And it's really hard and it's really good. Yeah. And then, you know, just for people watching like now or later, Mm -hmm. if you are somebody that is also online or you're hoping to build a business online, I do think it's good to remember that like, we can also learn to leverage the strength of the platform. It is what it is. It's imperfect, but we get to define kind of how we use it, how we show up, how we find solutions and all of that. And, um, and we can still actually do work that feels deeply meaningful. And, um, but it's never like, we don't have to aim for perfect, right? right? We get to keep shifting. And I think you're a really good model of that, of like listening and then shifting or iterating to find, well, what's next and what, you know, this isn't quite working anymore, but what, instead of quitting, what could I do? Mm-hmm. And I think that's a, a good example. Okay. Um, so let's see, I, I had mentioned how only more recently I realized that yeah. I'm actually a creative person and I never felt qualified. Um, do you think that creativity is just for some people? I have to read my notes because my brain isn't as, as with it as it, usually is um yeah so so we i think we already touched on this but we could just briefly um come back here to this idea of is creativity just for for some people or what happens when we all open up maybe to the idea that we we actually are creative beings and we have something to contribute and it doesn't have to be attached to numbers or income or performance yeah when i was in high school i painted And that's kind of when I really started being creative. Um, And I thought, everybody can do this. This is just not, this is not just particular to me. Everybody can be creative. And I still hold that belief, but it's changed so much. At the time, it was kind of naive in that I thought everyone could pick up a paintbrush and some paint and they could figure out how to paint because it came so easily to me. Mm. But now I realize creativity has a thousand different mediums and Mm -hmm. you know I was surprised to hear that you felt that way about yourself but then not because I feel that way about myself too how how would I can I even classify myself as a creative 
And, you know, the mediums are vast in that words are mediums. Paint is a medium. Ingredients to cook dinner, they're a medium. And even so far as, um, like, curiosity and questions. And what I mean by that is my husband's a child psychologist, and he asks incredible questions. And, of course, I never get to see him in the therapy room, but I get to see him at dinner across the table from our friends. And afterwards, I'm always like, where did you come up with those questions? Those were such good, open-ended, thoughtful questions. Mm -hmm. And for me, asking questions, especially in a social setting, is paralyzing. Um, so I'm looking to collect like a set of five questions I can ask and kind of have on deck. And he says to me when I ask him that, he says, well, Melissa, you just, you just got to be curious towards people. And it's that word just, you just need to do this. And what I recognized in what he was saying is something that I've often said to people that, oh, you just, you just need to pull out a couple ingredients from your pantry and you can whip up a meal. It's so right. easy. And that's my magic in asking questions, thoughtful questions like that. Those are his magic. And that's, I want to replace that word magic with that's his medium. And my medium right. is different. And our mediums for creativity are incredibly vast. And when right. you can begin to recognize when you're saying, oh, just do that, then that's your medium. And that's your piece of magic. And you can own it and protect it. It's your, it's your asset. And, um, and to expect others to have that same asset is when the problems kind of come up. Uh, when he thinks, oh, I could just be curious, or when I think, oh, he could just open the pantry to make dinner. That's when the yeah. problems come up. It's making me think, too, how my husband, he's not good at all. Like, if I'm not good with hands-on, he's way worse. Hmm. Like, I, <laughs> but um, he, but you know where I feel like his creativity shines? He's, a, he's an, he was an athlete at a fairly high level and he's mm -hmm. like uh, now just a community like kind of ref and coach. Oh, cool. He strategy in sports. He sees the all, things. It's shocking. I'm like, how did you see that? How mm -hmm. did you know from that sound where that player was with your back turned? Like mm -hmm. he just, there's this ability and strategic thinking in relation to this, that arena that mesmerizes me. Yeah. And, and I, and while we wouldn't normally liken that to creativity, it really highlights for me the giftedness of every single human yeah. on this planet and how much I love to remind people and help people even begin to believe the possibility yeah. that they are uniquely designed on purpose mm -hmm. with gifting. And that um, I know that I really despaired in life a lot and felt never, never good enough. And so I know that there's still so many people that are in that place where they yeah. just don't believe that they have anything actually like beautiful and powerful and gifted in them and it's like no we all have this yeah. light this little spark and it isn't our job to mimic each other it's our job to just offer what we have yeah. and if that's like like I always get super excited when I see online even social media like a, a woman who is on her deathbed and she's knitting little beanies mm. for preemie babies or somebody, you know, how people will yarn bomb things in the, yes. you know, just, just, it's like little bits of light all over the world, just doing whatever comes naturally to us. Yeah. And yes. And one thing that I am trying to do or to give people, which was given to me. And I think why I pursued a creative career is I had people that always affirmed me um, as a painter, like it started as early as in middle school and Mr. Siri in sixth grade art class said, Hey, Melissa, if you quit fooling around long enough, you're actually a good painter. And I heard him and I took his class again and I continued to take his class. And then I took Miss Crook's class in 10th and or ninth and 10th grade. And she said, Melissa, you're a good painter. And so I took honors art. And then I took AP art with Miss Martell in 12th. 11th and 12th grade and she affirmed me in so many ways she even affirmed some of my baking I was also interested in baking then and my things were horrible and yet I brought her a loaf of banana bread who knows if it was even cooked all the way through and she said Melissa <laughs> you're a good baker 
And so I kept mm-hmm. faking. And I am trying to turn that now. Like when I see that light or that magic or that, that medium that is so good in that person's hands to affirm that in them because it's been so powerful for me. And I'm not really sure what I would be doing without those affirmations. I think I'd still be wondering if I was a creative or if I could be creative. And yet I had a deep leaning. I just needed someone outside of myself to affirm it. Wow. Oh, that's that's cool because we can all offer that to each other right Mm -hmm. one little text one word of encouragement and affirm the the gifting that we see in each other yeah yeah it's so powerful um okay i'm coming back to my notes okay well what's the biggest obstacle in your life to trusting your creativity or making space for it Hmm. Hmm. i might be jumping ahead to another question you were going to ask um but as a creative or an idea chaser, I love to chase ideas. Um, and I think there is a little bit of hubris or pride in when I believe I can chase this idea. I think I can make this thing happen. And that's kind of the fuel that starts it. And then when I start any kind of creative project or chase an idea, I'm always met with failure at the beginning always and it's the biggest challenge and i actually just had this revelation maybe late last week maybe because of this i'm not sure um but i'm always met with failure and when i meet failure i want to quit so within the span of a week i'm quitting either a recipe i'm quitting blogging i'm quitting something and and maybe it's the same pride uh or I should replace that word with something more positive, but maybe it's the same thing that got me started in chasing that idea. I usually pick it back up and choose to stay. So creativity feels like this continual process of meeting failure, wanting to quit and choosing to stay and doing it over and over and over Mm -hmm. again. And anytime I notice a pattern in my life, I try to make note of it and fix it to create a beautiful solution to attend to this common problem. But with this particular problem, I'm recognizing that I need to let it be. It's the Mm. nature of creativity. And when I want to quit, I need to give myself space to quit, um, space to walk away. And then usually I find clarity there in that space to walk away and then choosing to stay is you know where the good stuff happens and you know we're all i said this in a post last week we're kind of built out of the rubble uh we're built out of the failure and maybe at the end of that it looks like a really good recipe that gets on the table in 20 minutes or maybe it looks like a cozy space that you've created in your room or a piece of writing that was incredibly powerful to somebody There's something beautiful that comes at the end of that, but the process is always messy for me. Mm -hmm. And my husband affirmed that in me that this process is true. He was Mm -hmm. like, Melissa, you're always quitting. And I was like, no, I'm (laughs) not. This is, this is just, this is a recent problem. He goes, "Mm -mm. (laughs) this is is an always thing happening in your life. But I'm also choosing to stay, which has power too. Yeah. Oh, there's so much in here. Like I have a million questions, um, but I just feel like this is so powerful for people, like whatever your life, you know, circumstances or career or whatever, is this idea that we can really think that other people don't struggle, other people don't wrestle, other people don't want to quit even. And it's like, uh, no, (laughs) (laughs) no, this is actually reality. And the more that we can just make peace with that, I think it's like, like you're saying, Oh, this is my process. I'm okay. okay. I'm safe. Breathe through this. It's going to be okay. I shared recently. Um, I don't remember if it was in a private video or not, but that um, every morning, my brain in the morning, mm-hmm. um, it's, is afraid. 
and my Krista's morning brain is really like uptight Mm -hmm. and annoying and she's like now you're like oh my god why did you post that Mm -hmm. what were you thinking you're not good enough to do that on and on and on and by afternoon she's chilling out and by Mm -hmm. evening she's all good Mm -hmm. and I'm like you know but morning Krista is like anxious and afraid and instead of waiting for that fearful part of my brain to just like never show up again Mm -hmm. I've had to learn how to just not react and just know oh there she is again Mm -hmm. and then I just like breathe through it you know pat her on the back and say you're gonna be okay (laughs) and then carry on with my day to be expected (laughs) yeah but it used to really unnerve Mm -hmm. me like all the anxiety all the fear all the inner chatter it used to be very um like it used to I can't think of a good word, but like, Mm -hmm. basically it kept me, it held me back from ever trying or playing or creating or just saying yes to things just because, and now I've had to learn like, oh, it's okay. It's okay that I feel this discomfort Mm -hmm. and, and everybody feels discomfort. And so it's okay. We don't have to get rid of it all. We just have to learn how to keep moving. Yes. Yeah. Which is so much of knowing yourself well, which is so hard it's incredibly hard Mm -hmm. so melissa i am curious though um when you want to quit is this Mm -hmm. like is it like your inner dialogue is saying like it's just like on overdrive yes yeah and it it's like all my fears are confirmed i have failed i thought i would not fail um but of course my biggest fear is that i'm going to fail and because my work is public it's it's an even harder fear to um, control all the time. I, nobody wants to fail at all, and especially not publicly. So, you know, my answer to that is to quit, to retreat, to hide. Uh, nobody knows then. And then my failure is quiet and it's private and it's only mine. And it's only mine. Yeah. That's something I'm really struggling through as I right now in in blogging want to retreat I don't want to put myself out there but I also don't want to present this over curated I don't want things to be too beautiful and I'm a designer I'm a creative I like beautiful things so I lean that way naturally Um, but because the internet is getting so big and you know some people are really loose with their thoughts And because my space is so personal, I just want to retreat, retreat, retreat. Mm -hmm. And my husband has thankfully been this steady voice of you can retreat if you want to, but just know that by not communicating your failures or not being who you are, which is you tend to be a pretty honest person, that you're creating an unhonest version of yourself online. And is that what you want to create? So I'm wrestling. It's a tug of war. It's a daily tug of war. And the post I just posted about uh, being pregnant again was the gentle nudge of my husband saying, post your honest thoughts, post them. And thankfully, people have been incredibly kind, but I'm nervous about failing online. I'm really nervous about that. And I'm nervous about what people think of me, partly because I'm a nine and partly because I'm a human. Yeah. And maybe you, do you think you're a kind of a sensitive soul? As I well? am. I am. And, and, you know, a lot of people will say you need a thick skin, especially if you work online, you need a thick skin. And I played soccer when I was young and I had incredibly calloused feet and my feet are actually still calloused. And I don't, I don't want like this part of me or the gut and the heart. I don't want to not feel those things because that's going to impact everything about how I move through this life. And so I'm towing that line of how do I stay soft Mm -hmm. and how do I hear things and how do I keep the things I need to keep and then discard the things that are irrelevant I, I believe I am a highly sensitive person Mm -hmm. as well. And I a hundred percent am with you on, I don't want a thick skin. I want to be real and be me. And that Mm -hmm. means keeping this soft, just Mm -hmm. like you said, because I've worked too long and hard to get to here, this place where I am 
strong and resilient and yeah. capable of telling the truth about the joy, the fear, all of it, and not crumbling. Mm -hmm. And also, I have to have safeguards yeah. in my life to protect my mind and my heart and my body and all of that, mm -hmm. because it is very vulnerable to show up online and people don't understand all the comments we get and all the things and how sometimes, not always, but mm -hmm. sometimes it feels like you're being torn down, torn down, torn down. And it can be hard. And honestly, earlier this week, I had just like, I don't know if I can do this right now. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I know where I belong. Like I know mm -hmm. that I'm in the right place and it's just about, doing what I need to do to protect myself in a really hard season so I can heal and then keep moving forward. But yeah. Um, but I think we do need like online. I want to see other people that have these tender hearts mm -hmm. and keep showing up in a way that is healthy for them. Yeah. 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 It feels like the only way for me to stay when, you know, I'm, when I'm in that rhythm of quitting and staying, but it doesn't make staying any easier, I think, which is also a good revelation for me. I like easy things. I like to feel cozy. It's part of who I am. I like homeostasis, everything to be okay all the time. And in choosing to stay, I'm also choosing that things won't always be okay mm -hmm. and that I have to kind of ride those waves and be reminded that I, like you said, I'm a resilient person. And I will make it through the highs and the lows and highs and lows are okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, okay. Well, do you have any ideas or suggestions for helping us and the listeners learn to trust ourselves mm -hmm. as we make space for creativity in our lives? Um, yeah. Oh, got some texts coming in. I, I, this isn't the best advice, but I would say pay attention to your habits. Like, you know, listen to what, what you're doing. Are you, are you following this rhythm? And your rhythm might sound different than mine of getting excited idea by an idea, chasing it, meeting failure, wanting to quit, then choosing to stay. Your rhythm might be different, but if you can understand your rhythm or if you can first see your rhythm, maybe write it down, understand it, then, then you can begin to harness that rhythm and being able to harness what's naturally going on is a really powerful thing. And, and your rhythm is naturally going to look different than mine. And I think my other piece of advice would be that the rhythm might not be so beautiful and perfect, that it, your rhythm might always have, you know, something like mine, if there's a piece of failure in there and wanting to quit. I don't love that about myself or about my rhythm, but I know it's just in the nature of it. So I'm going to honor how it is. I'm going to let it be. And I'm going to work within the natural order of that. Um, and just knowing too that creativity is such a vulnerable process. It's like, it's such a vulnerable dance. And I like to think about creativity or an idea as, as another person that I'm engaging with or dancing with. And that's a dynamic relationship. And it's a relationship that I'm not necessarily in control of. I kind of have to ride it out. And where I think I'm going to begin in a creative process is usually never where I end. And for someone who, you know, kind of likes to have control over things, it's a hard ride to ride sometimes. But the good things always come out in the end. And in some ways, you know, I feel like I'm holding an idea so loosely and I'm, I'm just holding it for right now. And somehow it's like working its way through me and out of me and then probably and in, hopefully into someone else and, you know, a change agent in their life and then winding its way through, um, that it's, it's with me for a second, but that it's this, it's alive and well. So hold on to it loosely. I even talk about, um, or one thing I remind myself of all the time, and I don't remember if I got this advice from someone else, but I hold my ideas, especially the big ones, the big scary ones, like a boomerang. 
and I throw the idea out there to someone usually, not just to myself, but I'll usually verbally communicate it with someone. And I usually have some stipulations for the idea that I throw out there with it. And if it comes back to me and I'm still willing to catch it when it comes back or I've acquired the necessary skills or whatever it may be, or if I'm still willing to chase that idea, then I catch it and hold on to it and run with it. If not, it's out there and I think maybe someone else catches it and that's okay. Hmm. It's that big magic idea. I, that but, must be where, did she talk about the boomerang? I, I don't know if she, if she mentioned a boomerang, but okay. it, that's what it's reminding me yes. of, that idea. Yeah. Well, also she was on my brain already mm -hmm. as you were talking because I was, my husband and I were driving home and listening to a podcast where it was brought up again, this idea that Elizabeth Gilbert wrote for 20 years before yes. she actually made a living from her writing. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking of that, how maybe um, for creativity is what if we shift and we think about it as a way of life mm -hmm. as yeah. opposed to a particular outcome, mm -hmm. which I think is hard if you need to pay the bills. Right. And right. But and, and so I'm not really speaking to that because, I mean, that's a different pressure. But like, can we can we open up to the idea that we are creative beings and and creativity looks like play and using our mm -hmm. gifting and, and staying open to possibility and everything and also taking the longer view yeah. that maybe we put so much pressure on ourselves to perform and the idea of, wow, 20 years to make a living mm -hmm. might sound discouraging, but if you really want to write, that's okay. You just write. Right. Right. Um, I have, um, I don't know if you can see it. I'd have to turn my, oh, it's going to be backwards, but I have this sign in my kitchen that says good things take time. And it's so simple and we hear it all the time and it's a cliche, but the internet moves so fast now that we think that good things don't take time, that good things happen really quickly. Yeah. Um, but good things take, good things just take a lot of time and way more than we expect. And sometimes it changes along on, along the path, but the path is always worth walking. And that's a little bit too of my rub with the internet of figuring out how do I stay in this space that moves really fast? And when everything's moving really fast, do I need to also meet that expectation? Mm. And I tried to meet that expectation and I, I kind of ebb and flow trying to be like everyone else around me and realizing I don't work like that. Yeah. The good stuff comes so slowly, years sometimes for me. Mm. I cannot operate in that realm. I cannot, I mm -hmm. get, I will absolutely quit before I mm -hmm. will choose to live in the world of hustle. I don't want it and I can't do it. Yeah. It is so exhausting. And I think that's where my, if I start losing myself and my eyes mm -hmm. start looking too much at what other people are doing or how they seem to be managing, yeah. I can get discouraged. But if I just focus on, but what do I want to bring? Mm -hmm. And then just let that be good enough without worrying about numbers and all the things. Then I'm having fun. Yeah. Like I'm having fun right now yes. talking to you. Likewise. And it has nothing to do with anything but meeting human to human, you know? And yep. so. Yeah. When I um, put then, my blinders on, I do yeah. really well. I'm okay when I have my blinders on. But as soon as I take them off and see people doing things differently, um, I have a lot of trouble because I, I try to mimic what they're doing. I want to be successful like them because who doesn't want to be successful? And that's when I meet failure the quickest when I'm trying to be someone else besides yeah. myself. Yeah. Well, and just one more thought I wanted to add um, because I, I am a recovering perfectionist mm -hmm. and this is something that I just feel like daily, no matter how hard I've worked, life keeps giving me opportunity to just practice their mm. coming face to face with the messy reality that life is not fair. It is not easy. Uh, you know, you cannot control the outcome. Yeah. Um, all I get to control is my response mm. and how I show up every day. That's it. Mm -hmm. And um, but I was thinking in terms of the creativity as well, is that for me, lower the bar. Yeah. Like, um, and a quick example, I've been published, self-publishing these little seasonal mindfulness yeah. journals and having fun. So imperfect. Like mm. my year has been nasty. 
Like, and, but I wouldn't quit because I, and it, and my, my creative partner who lives in Bath, England, Mm -hmm. she too has been just walking through really hard stuff, but we've just enjoyed connecting and doing a creative project. That's almost been like this beautiful little lifeline in the middle of a storm. Mm -hmm. And, um, when I focus so what can happen is I can start moving the bar and if I'm watching what other people are doing I can judge that as not enough because Mm -hmm. I should have a publishing deal I should do this I should do that yawn all that does is tear me down if I just choose joy in whatever it is that I want to do I do the thing whereas if I wait for the perfect if I move the bar and I hold my breath waiting let's say for a publishing deal I'm never going to do the thing I feel drawn to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I have to notice my tendency to move the bar and bring it on back and say, no, you're good. Mm -hmm. You're good. Mm -hmm. So there's another just great example of know yourself really well and then work within the confines of yourself. That's yeah. A lot of good can come from, from that. Yeah. So Stacy is saying, I love the conversation so much. At least I know there are two other women who think and feel like I do. <laughs> Yay. There's more of us out there. I feel the same way that I must be an anomaly. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Where do we want to go? Well, let's go. Let's just talk about how you're shifting course in your work, Melissa. Mm-hmm. So you have this successful business that you say it started as a side project almost for you, like mm-hmm. something for you, but then it started becoming successful. There's money attached. Yeah. There's influence attached. And now you're not, you know, you weren't completely happy. You were considering quitting, walking mm-hmm. away altogether. And then last fall when we chatted, I think you had maybe already made the decision to not quit, yeah. but you were still really trying to figure out what that was going to look like. So mm-hmm. this is all about creativity and trusting yourself and maybe like iterating or resting versus just walking away a hundred percent. So can you just walk us a little bit through yeah. that process? Yes. So when we met, I was coming out of a deep season of wanting to quit. And, you know, I sound pretty repetitive, but it's because there's a lot of repetitive things happening, whether, you know, it's as zoomed in and as small as wanting to quit a recipe that failed the first time or as big as I think I need to walk away from all of this. It's the same thing. So I recognized that uh, I wanted to walk away from blogging. Probably the funny thing is it was during the launch of my book. So I had just written this book and it was published and I was in what seemed like the climax of my career, the height of it. And I wanted out, I wanted nothing to do with it. But in those moments I had to stay because I had to see this book through. Um, And then I gave myself space. So this was at the start of 2018. My book published in April and then probably, and from April to May, I helped to launch the book. And then from May, I think until June or July, I gave myself space to figure things out, which space is incredibly valuable. Uh, When I painted, I painted with a lot of white space so that I could direct people's eyes to what exactly what I wanted them to see. And when I give myself space, it helps me to see exactly what I need to see. And during that time, I listened to a podcast. It was um, it was Oprah's, not her masterclass, soul conversations. And she had been interviewing Will I Am, and I was in the backyard restaining our fence, listening to Will I Am. I had listened to it twice because it was so powerful for me. And I'm really bad at quoting things, but I'm gonna try. Will I Am said, You wouldn't want a horse named Hustle. He's gonna give out. You want a horse named, I don't remember. He's gonna last, he's gonna keep moving. Um, a horse name. I wrote it down somewhere. It's, there's a blog post on my site called the horse name hustle. Um, it was, it was that profound and it made me realize, oh, duh, of course I would not want to hustle. Of course I, of course I can't last in a, in the pace of a hustle, in the pace of a sprint, which is what I was doing. And so I recognized I needed to take a step back and, um, slow down 
and I had been saying it when I went back and read my posts, all my answers were there. I had been saying probably for a year prior to, I need to slow down. I need to slow down in different words. And I could finally hear myself at that point. And maybe that's because I gave myself space. Um, so if anybody read during that time, you probably had more insight and wisdom about me than I had about myself. Um, and what I also recognize, I think I took the Enneagram around that time. And so I recognize kind of who I was, that I am generally pretty agreeable. I'm easy to be around, but that also makes me kind of an amoeba. I see myself in everyone. And when I first took the Enneagram, I was every single number. I thought for sure I was every single number because I... A quick way to t determine if you're a nine. <laughs> yep. And you won't believe you're a nine. That's the only one I absolutely wasn't because I didn't oh, like the so sound funny. of her. I love it. Um, and what I was doing, it's everything we've been talking about this whole conversation. I picked my head up and I looked at all these people who were successful and I thought, I'm like them. I have similar traits as them. And so I tried to be like them. And in that process, what I wasn't doing is I wasn't valuing my asset, which was, I'm actually a pretty creative person. It's just my natural asset. And, what, and then I wasn't preparing for my deficit. Actually, I was, I was trying to, in some ways I was trying to grow my deficits. I was trying to be a more type A person, which a lot of my friends are type A and my peers and they, they, they were succeeding. And I was trying to do what they were doing and in trying to be like them and not trying to be like myself, I was failing at the things I was good at because I wasn't doing them. Mm -hmm. And I was, the, I was still failing at the things I was bad at because I'm just not so great at them. And I recognized if I wanna be creative, then I have to protect that. I have to protect that asset and it's going to be really hard for me because there are confines within the day to be both creative, a right brain, and to be an analytical left brain. And maybe I could do that, but I'm going to sacrifice my creativity. And I came to the point when I realized I don't want to sacrifice that thing that I'm really good at, that reason I started doing this in the first place, the thing that, that people were drawn to. Um, right. And then I realized, so the only way that I can stay is if I can bring someone else on with a completely different mm. skill set. And I was kind of nervous because my husband had worked with me before. And one of his biggest concerns for me was I don't naturally have the skill set to be the boss, the, the leader of a business. I have the skill set to be a type B creative. And, you know, they're, they're not always, they're not often the leader of a company. And I still had to stand in that leadership role. And so that's something, um, I ended up hiring someone, her name is Kimberly. She's amazing. She's the reason I am able to stay. Uh, she thinks differently than I do. Thank you, Kimberly. Yes. <laughs> she thinks differently than I do. And the beautiful thing is that I think <laughs> we really do a good job of appreciating each other's assets. We're not, yeah. I'm not looking for her to do my job and, and she's not looking for me to do her job. We, we know our lanes and we're able to stay in them and operate yeah. in them. And I'm also able to quickly see like, you know, even scheduling this, you saw how poor my email communication is. I'm even learning in that, like that I need to send to Kimberly because she's good at this and she will keep things rolling and she will make sure that I convert mountain standard time to, to central time <laughs> because it's just not my skill set. And in that whole process, I quit apologizing for all the things I wasn't good at, which I was mm. doing all the time. And I started advocating for the things that I was good at. And I learned mm. to stay in that lane. This is where I'm good. This is where I'm not. And I don't need to be her. I can be her. Yeah. Oh, that makes me so happy. Yeah, which is kind of, I think some people even hearing all this, they wonder if I am a nine because they say, oh, you're very insightful about yourself. It's taken me years and years and years to, and maybe this is true of everyone, every number, but just to fully accept who I am and not even try to change it. Like 
I'm in the space right now of almost staying in that process of who I am and just trying to root right here, understand myself really well and exist Mm -hmm. within the natural parameters of, of me. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing a lot better in that space. And it, you know, I think some people might hear this and think, well, how are you ever going to grow? And there's seasons of growth. But right now in my business, in my blog, if I'm going to stay, I need to grow this thing that's already present. And maybe later in my life, I'll grow another aspect of myself. But um, right now in this scenario, I need to stay in my lane. So I have a a, a little mini course that Mm -hmm. I'm teaching soon, and it's called um, Become Who You Really Are. Mm. And I'm, I'm teaching it because it's really, it's sort of like this intro, quick intro to the work that I do in all the ways that I'm working, which is really just helping us see that we're already amazing. And when we deepen our roots of self-awareness and self-compassion, then we can take imperfect action to build the lives we want or show it fully to our lives. And it, it's, and I really, it always feels very important to me that the way that we learn to really be present and show it fully to our lives is not by trying to become better or different versions of ourselves. It's actually by being who we are. Mm-hmm. It's by stopping all the comparing and the um, trying to be like and trying to measure up or keep up. And we just unpeel the layers that we, you know, of self-protective mechanisms and old stories about how we're not good enough. And what we discover in there is that, oh, here I am and Mm. I'm already pretty cool. And I have work to do in this world and a place of contribution. And I actually don't have to look or sound or feel like anybody else except me. And for me, there's just freedom in that. And it also reminds me as a mom of three that I've always wanted to help my kids mostly just shine where you're meant Mm. to shine, just shine. Yes, we all have weaknesses and sometimes we can learn tools or workarounds. Like if you're not a good speller, we can use, you know, apps. We can, we can accommodate our weaknesses, but why spend our short lives focused on trying to kind of get strong in these areas instead of just shining in our areas where we're, we are naturally like gifted. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And when you think of a business too, you want people that are able to perform different skills. And I've heard a lot of people, especially a lot of creatives, uh, have trouble hiring people because they want to hire someone like themselves. It's just our natural tendency. And probably for non creatives too, it's just our natural tendency as humans to be drawn to people similar to us. And, each of them have said it, it failed, it didn't really work. And that feels like such a beautiful example that we need to own and know our differences and then compile mm-hmm. different ones. And that the puzzle should be really dynamic and diverse to work well. And that I need to be my tiny little puzzle and someone else can be their tiny little puzzle piece. And when yeah. we're connected, it's a really good thing. But when we try yeah. to be all of them, it's, it's not so Do you know Kimberly's Enneagram type? She didn't take it. Um, I don't, I told her about it after we started and I don't remember if she told me. I need to follow up with her and ask her. So my creative project partner, my creative partner on my journals, Mm -hmm. she was my client and I was helping her kind of dig into the Enneagram and learn about self-awareness, self-compassion. And then after about a year or so, we decided to start this project together. Mm -hmm. She's an Enneagram five. We are, we're both thinkers and we, but it's what you're describing. I never, never thought I could work with somebody else. Mm -hmm. Um, And we work beautifully together. Mm. Like you said, we stay in our own lane. We respect each other. We see each other's gifting, but we don't try to be each other. I know my role. She knows her role. And we, so I do this and she, and it's just a beautiful, Mm. delightful um, collaboration. That is so cool. 
That's yeah. so cool. I'm so grateful. I, I don't think I could work with another Enneagram one. I think we would hurt each other. <laughs> oh my gosh. If I worked with another nine, we'd never get anything done. You'd just be like, <laughs> I don't know, maybe. <laughs> It'd yeah, it's, it's very fun. Okay, let's, uh, I'm pretty sure we're over our time. So I'm going to just see where we're at. Um, let's see. Well, okay, we'll end. Um, actually, you know what? I think we've already chatted enough. I don't know the time. I have a feeling we're probably towards the end of an hour. I think so. Yeah. I yeah. Think so. so in, in um, closing, I'm just going to ask you what's lighting you up these days, Melissa, and what's challenging you. And then you can tell people how, you know, you'd love them to connect with you. And hey, Beck. Lighting me up. Uh, when you asked this, it, it took me a second. It took me a second because I'm in this like cautiously optimistic phase of life, um, understanding that it's both good and bad. But to I am what's actually lighting me up is getting offline. I've lived a lot of my last 10 years of life, 11 years of life online. And I didn't realize how much of my life I was living online and how little of it I was living offline. And I really love life offline and I disappear a lot. And that lights me up like no other. Um, it's a good place to be. It's a great place to be. It's a good place to truly be known online I'm I'm known by what I choose to publish and I, I love the personal connections which we moved around a lot and we're really trying to root here in Minneapolis so living life online make offline makes me light up and we also have this new project that we're about to work on and I'm really nervous about it but I also really believe in it that I haven't really announced it yet so that's a horrible teaser but I'm cautiously <laughs> optimistic about this new project okay, in this new exciting. big endeavor. Okay. And the other part was lighting you up. On What's challenging you these days? Challenging. I would say uh, just still figuring out how to stay. It's, I haven't sorted through all of those things. And some days it feels really good online and some days it doesn't. So yeah. I'm still sorting through those things and trying to pay attention to myself and my needs um, because my work is so personal. Um, I'm sure you feel that too. Uh, and then you can find me online on my blog at thefauxmartha.com. And I'm on Instagram, Pinterest, and Facebook under thefauxmartha.com. But I'm mostly on my blog. I have really protected my time to creating because that's what makes me happy. So I'm creating on my blog mostly. Okay. Melissa, thank you so much for saying yes. And another congratulations about your little babe thank who's you. on the way. And whatever this exciting project is that's coming down the pipeline or whatever. Um, so, but I really, I just appreciate you um, for, I just feel like you do feel like a gentle soul to mm -hmm. me, like somebody that I am safe with. Mm -hmm. And I like that and I appreciate it. So. Likewise, I felt that of you. And I think I, one thing I wanted to make sure I told you is the way that you weave together words, words are your medium and your canvas is a screen and you are an, a beautiful writer and that you're able to craft ideas everyday, normal, ordinary things that we're all going through and then and tell them in a beautiful, captivating way, which is a, a huge gift, an incredible gift. So thanks for Thank sharing. Thank you for that beautiful word of affirmation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I will receive it. <laughs> Good. I hope so. Okay. Thanks everybody thanks, for watching. Okay. Bye, Melissa. Bye.